present the Sunday Business Show on Today FM and one of the reasons that I love when Shane gives me a buzz uh, to come here is when I'm with entrepreneurs it's lovely for one main main reason entrepreneurs by their nature by their definition whether they want to be or are they are positive because you have to be positive to believe that you're going to sell to the world or wherever I'm going to move myself down here so that you might see some of your guests there for a second and therefore the if I can suggest a couple of things here today. First of all, don't forget that, uh, to use your hashtag WASUP14. Another thing that Shane forgot to mention is that you're beaming it to the world. You're on air, aren't you, into the internet to the world? Uh, yeah, live streaming everyone. <laughs> live streaming to the world, so you are on. Um, what I would like to do, because uh, uh, the, the style of the Sunday Business Show, my style is informal. I want you guys to get buzzed up. I want you to ask questions. I want you to use these people and they're so different, as you'll hear from their little stories, and they're not going to make any formal presentations. We're having a chat. Find out and get them to answer your questions. And my job is to start off those questions, but I really want you guys to engage immediately. We have about an hour, so if we say quarter to two, if that's okay, uh, we will uh, uh, go for lunch. But if, um, and if we, another thing is to remember that you have these people over lunch as well, so you can do one-on-ones. And also within the room, I've already been uh, talking to some um, of the entrepreneurs who are here and their ideas and what they're trying to achieve. And it's lovely. And I love being down in Kerry for one very good reason. My dad was from Kerry. My dad was also an entrepreneur, and I understand that whole thing. And he always, now he was biased, being from Kerry, but he always said that there was innovation and entrepreneurship here, which wasn't to be found elsewhere in the country. So I guess he was talking his own book, as they would say. So I am going to introduce my victims, as they say. You've already heard, uh, heard Ed. Ed calls himself the ex-entrepreneur of the year. There's no such thing. He is an Entrepreneur of the Year 2012. And if you guys want to see and get maybe um, encouragement, there is a series of programs on RTE on a Monday night about the EY, because they don't call themselves Ernst & Young anymore. They spend millions trying to get rid of Ernst & Young, but everybody still says Ernst & Young, so maybe they're not so good at their business. The um, EY Entrepreneur of the Year. and. Just looking at those guys, they are brilliant. And we also work with them because we get some of their entrepreneurs um, up, uh, onto the radio show. And so far I've had George McMullen, a guy who plants seed in all of the premiership um, clubs in Britain and uh, onto the grass, should I say, and uh, turf there. And he is in 20 countries, I think, from based in Ireland. And last weekend we had a magnificent guy called, um, uh, what's his name again? R R R uh, D Dobson, yeah, yeah, Stuart Dobson. He's based in Dungannon. Now, what he does is, and again, I hope that you take kind of, you say, why didn't I think about this moment out of this? What he has done, his family were in abattoirs. He looked into the offcuts where the stuff was being dumped, of which there was many, much, and he said, I must be able to sell this stuff. So nowadays, he has only 13 people working for him, but he sells to, I don't know, 20, 40 countries around the world. He'll sell ears, eyes, noses, and other bits, including the downstairs bits, to the world. And he, in his first year, had a turnover of, two, of 3 million sterling, and this year he is going to do 40 million sterling in turnover. Now, I didn't ask him what his margin was, but I can tell you, he's selling rubbish that he used to say went into the bin. There, are, is, there is innovation and brilliant ideas everywhere. That's enough for me. Oh, I should always say, listen to the Sunday Business Show, Sunday, 10 o'clock in the morning. We are talking about the innovation mindset. We have Christina Luminia, and the good thing about Christina being here is that Christina has money. So that's uh, very important. Edmund, you've just heard of. Aoife Nivori. Aoife um, is, uh, has a software, again, based here in Tralee, and the software, it's sports software. She has rebranded. She's now called Salosa. And, uh, Salasso. Salasso, come on, Salasso. And the, uh, that software is being used by premiership um, uh, footballers in the UK. <laughs> All of them. A massive, massive uh, success on her part. She's now up... At, this is going to frighten you. You saw our boys in green the other day almost winning. Um, the <laughs> Finnish... She's just told me over coffee there. She's been up in Finland uh, trying to sell her product up there. There is an academy for the soccer players in Finland, a tiny little country. They have only 11,000 students between 10 and 16, is it? Between 10 and 16, yes. Hey, I mean, there must be. That's the way to do it grow a football team, I guess. And then finally, we have Bernie Goldback, 
for, this is a really interesting story. <laughs> a former US Air Force um, uh, pilot gave it up for rock and roll. I didn't actually get to that part as to why he actually gave it up. But he's now lecturing in, in, um, in uh, Limerick, in Limerick, in Limerick Institute of Technology, LIT. And he is going to talk to you, I think, about ways of learning. I, so that's what I kind of understood from you, okay? So it's a real mix. And my first question, I better start with somebody, is I'm going to start with Aoife, because I know most about her, uh, is small, uh, and I, you're going to have to get yourself some mics, I think, or you're not mic'd up, you know. Yeah. Um, tell you what I do. Well, if I just give this to you, if I say to you, Aoife, if you tell us about, based in intralee, how difficult is, is it to start, uh, to be taken seriously, and then to grow? Um, well, I suppose take Tralee out of it for, uh, for starters. Um, I think, you know, anyone who starts a business, um, it's hard work. There's no question about it. I, I, I'm sure Ed would agree with me and um, the rest of the panel. There's nothing easy about starting your own business. And, um, you know, I, I can remember when, we, when I started on the Endeavour programme here in Tralee, a um, fantastic programme actually run by IT Tralee in conjunction with um, Jerry Kennelly and Shannon Development at the time. Um, that was really where I started thinking about um, developing a business and so on. And I, I remember distinctly the first day Jerry came, Kennelly came into the room and he said, all of you sitting down there, if you think you're going to start a business and make a successful business out of a nine-to-five job, just get out, get out of this room. That was my first introduction to starting your own business, and he's absolutely right. It's hard work, but it's actually very, very rewarding. And let's go back to what um, Ed was saying earlier on. If you do something you like and you get a buzz out of doing it, then it's fantastic. And that's what we're doing. I, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, I, I was saying to Karen earlier on, when I see this thing of CEO and founder and entrepreneur and everything, for me, at the end of the day, I'm a physio. I started as a physio. I'll always see myself as a physio. And for me, it's all about exercise. And, and what we're doing is developing a software to promote exercise, to help you if you have a pain in your back, if you have a problem with your knee, do the exercises that get you better. And for us, for me, I get a great buzz out of when people use our software, when we get the feedback from customers, from physios, from patients and so on, say, wow, this is great, this is really helping me with my chronic pain. That's, that's what gives me the buzz. So um, I suppose... Uh, I've got to bring you back again to the question about being based in Tralee. Is it easy? <laughs> okay, well, Tralee, Tralee no, actually... I'm going to ask you a question because you mentioned Fire and Four Airport, for example. Yeah. Is, I, I've just come down from Dublin. It, was, it took me three hours. It is so easy to get around the small island now, but it's even equally easy in your case, to get to the UK, to get to London? Yeah, it's actually easier for me to get to London yeah. than to Dublin. Um, and it's, for me, it's a much bigger market. It's a no-brainer for me. And I, I, as I was saying to you earlier, I send Michael O'Leary a Christmas card every year. I love that man. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't actually be in the position we're in. Because having Far and Four, having the ability to get to London, um, you know, a couple of times a week if we need to. I'm, I'm usually in London every week, if not every, or, or at least every second week. Um, we've, we've big customers over there. We, we're engaged with Bupa over there. We're engaged with guys in St. Thomas's over there. With lots of different customers. Um, they're, you know, they're within a, a three-hour journey for us. It took, you, it took you three and a half hours to come from Dublin. Three. So, three. <laughs> Depends on the traffic, but it can sometimes me, take me five hours to get to a customer in Dublin, if you include time for parking and so on. I can actually get to a customer in, in, in London in, in three to three and a half hours. So, um, Fan 4 is great. Brilliant. And, you know, I, I, if there's one thing I'd like people to get out of this, we need to keep Far and Four open for business. I think you'd agree with me. We need to keep flights coming in and out of Far and Four. Use Far and Four um, and make the Wild Atlantic Way um, and and the West Coast accessible to to uh, not to Dublin. You know, and by all means, it needs to be accessible to Dublin, but it needs to be accessible to the world because the world the world is out there for companies such as ours. A perfect cue for me because Ed mentioned that there were two hundred thousand new people in the world every day. The vast majority of those are overseas and I work with a company called Elucidate and Elucidate uh, does digital marketing training and uh, they put through a recent, there was a block of 10, um, uh, of ten a program of um, 10 units times 20 people so there were 200 people went through their program and at the end of the program uh, on each occasion they did a mini survey and they got feedback from their um, students. The they asked one question which was very, very telling, and this is a negative, is they asked them how many people were thinking of exporting. Now, these people are in digital marketing. How many people were thinking of exporting? Any suggestions as to how many people were thinking of exporting? 20%. Ed, comment please. 
Okay, on that. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, one other yeah. thing I have to say, I'm very sorry. When you look at a cake, you don't see a cake, you see ingredients. I see cake and I want to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to deconstruct yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, I think marketing, I think digital, it's, you look, it's all fierce important. It's about getting a message across. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes in that in the last number of years. Technology has driven that. Um, look, to me, the world, the world is our oyster. You know, there's a certain limited market in Ireland. I think, you know, you have to develop your market, you know, in Ireland first. Uh, it's probably the easiest market to, to do it in, in your home market. Um, but look, digital is very important, you know. Uh, you take that, you take videos, you take you take everything, you know. It's about it's about getting your message across, you know. Is that that's good, yeah, yeah, okay. And we've now have a software and a we call it hardware if you wish, you know, like manufacturing. And I was speaking with the lady from the um, this old Writers Week uh, earlier on. And that they are also, if you think about it, in an export market and Enterprise Ireland. You, I couldn't say enough good things about them. And anybody who has worked with them, I hope, because it certainly has been my experience, will say so many positive things about them. They have so much knowledge, and they have so many people wishing to help. And say on the, on the um, list of writers week I was just suggesting there, is that they have research on the German market, on the German cultural market, and they have identified 35,000 people who love the Titanic on their Facebook page only in Germany. So if you, they get into that detail. So if you find an area, it could be anything, Enterprise Ireland may be able to help you and trying to locate where your next big uh, market and audience is. Christina, you've got the money. <laughs> so uh, just to your previous comment in terms of um, the, the market, you know, being larger than uh, Ireland, um, and looking at uh, not necessarily the money part, European pioneers, but the uh, thought box part, um, you know, uh, we launched our games in November 2012, and we didn't even focus on Ireland. Uh, we went straight international, and we were uh, a team of two or three people here in Dublin, and we reached 57 countries just with the power of technology and Twitter and, um, uh, you know, bloggers and, and so on. So tapping into that, um, uh, is also a huge potential out there uh, to actually be able to sell in a lot of different countries without having a presence uh, in that country as well. But it doesn't happen by itself. There's a lot of work in it. Yeah, definitely. But it's a How lot easier. Hours? Because Ed obviously spends all your days up in the air. You obviously travel vastly as well. Time is, you, you sacrifice time if you wish to be an entrepreneur. We may as well put it down and say, you know, it does. But then again, it's your passion. Yeah, so uh, in terms of how many hours am I working? Um, usually around 60, 70 hours per week. I'm trying to get that down now <laughs> as much as I can. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I've had a really uh, understanding boyfriend until now, but I, I need to to start thinking about my personal life as well. Um, but you know yourself, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you basically leave uh, home at nine o'clock in the morning and you, you're struggling to take the last bus home um, to actually go um, you know, and, and have some sleep and food or whatever. You, yeah. Bernie, there are so many questions I could ask you, but one of them is going to be, obviously you know everything about tech. <laughs> Because you are gold top, is it? Or top gold? Well, uh, if you look for my name on the internet, you're normally going to end up with someone who golfs now. No, so my, my found, name is top... The psychosymmetric tests I, are I, up there. Yeah. Top, top gold top gold with a D at the end. And um, yeah, I, I've been around on Twitter since 2006 and probably the only person in the room that had a Facebook account before 2005. So I did that because I was training creative media students for an export-based thought process. It, it's not just a classroom, it's beyond the classroom. And I tried to extend what I do dynamically at the moment I present by putting things that I'm presenting in a public space. So it's either a shared space on OneDrive, or if it's semi-polished but not ready for prime time even, I pop it across the slide share. And the measure of merit is a, a potential employer who never knew that we trained somebody to do the skill that's in the deck will come calling or asking me for a follow-up. You know, that's for clarification on a skill set, which then normally leads into paid internship for a student. And you do this for selfish reasons? Yeah, I'm very selfish about it. I normally tell students I feel bad about being a lecturer. I'm bored after two years doing any job. I've been doing this one for about 12 years. 
Um, and my first statement when I open the academic year is normally, um, thanks for being here. Uh, I'll let you know why I'm here. I'm here because I need to train you so that you can pay my pension to pay the taxes that help me through uh, senility. And that's very selfish reason. That's, that's straightforward. And, if, and normally I tell people, at the end of two hours of something I'm telling you, if you cannot reimagine it and figure out where it works better for you, because I'm wrong with the way I said it, or it works better for you because you can make money on it, well, then you've wasted your time, and maybe you ought to tell me that, that, hey, you wasted my time. I didn't get it. But most of their friends will say, yeah, I can take that and go there with this. So... Um, confident that because I've been part of a, near, yeah, I've been part of three failed startups that you have to do ten to get successful here so I'm surrounded by people who have been more successful than me and maybe they've taken away all my success but potential <laughs> but uh, no I've been through the, the, the startup realm either as a director of something that fails or close in uh, to, to, to watching a company liquidate not pleasant well no I mean like you lose sleep and then you go and on. Your money. Yeah, I, I'm still recovering from one of them. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Please, if you want to uh, interrupt or not interrupt, please join, as they say, join the conversation. Just put up your hand and we'll... Gentlemen and Chuck. Yeah. Just shout, shout out because uh, we yeah, otherwise... I want to ask you about uh, competitive analysis and competition. If, if the world is your market, your competitive landscape is people like you anywhere in the world. So how do you, how do, you do a competitive analysis international. That's a great question to Aoife, I think. Aoife. Because I think what you're saying is, and it's something that troubles all entrepreneurs, is what if somebody else is doing this, the same thing I'm doing, but it's in Dubai maybe, yeah. but they're doing it better. <coughs> Do you worry about that? Is somebody creating a better software than yours at this very moment? I suppose in terms of competition, and from early on, um, we would have had a mentor who actually always thought the competition is great because it proves there's a market for your product. And if there's a guy over in the States who's actually doing this, then brilliant, I'm in, I'll invest, is, was his attitude. So that actually gave me great confidence. And, and yeah, there are other people out there doing what we're doing, but I suppose for us, a lot of it is about the vision of your company. Um, I actually attended a, um, a marketing uh, type seminar that Brita there organized for the MBA students here. It was two years ago probably, Brita, at this stage. And that really opened my eyes to the, the importance of marketing and the importance of telling people who you are and why, why you are doing this. And I think for, for the meetings and the conversations we're involved in, we just lay it all on the table and we make it very clear we're here because we're a company of physios who really believe that actually there are far too many back surgeries and knee surgeries and hip surgeries and so on going on in this world. And we believe that by getting more people doing better exercise, doing it daily, building it into your daily routines, we will save the healthcare system an awful lot of money. You know, a back surgery costs 20 grand, a physio session costs 50 quid. That's a no-brainer for any health insurance company that buys into it. So that's, I suppose, coming back to it, you know, while internet is great and all the rest of it, sometimes, you know, and that's why, you know, we all spend so much time traveling. Nothing beats actually sitting across the table from somebody, telling them what, who you are, what you're about, and why you're actually trying to do this. So that would be my, my answer to that. Bernie, you want to Yeah, in? let me... Let me answer that question through the framework that I'd put on it. So um, you're, you're totally correct, you. what you said. I would ask a student who's thinking they have the best idea since sliced bread to say, can you express in five words, articles and prepositions don't count. Then, can you find that five word thing on Google, because Google knows more than you do. Then, can you conceptualize your stuff in an image and a keyframe of a video and of a short text, no more than 220 words, because that's all the investors really read, and certainly that's all your Facebook audience reads. And finally, at, when you publish all that into some place that's findable, can I ask my phone, the system on this is Cortana, your five word phrase, and do you show up on the first page? If you don't, you fail before you started. So, I have fitness guys. I have 56 people that are earning a BSc in sports and conditioning. They need your app. They need you as a guest speaker as well. So, there's a straight offer. Uh, and I'm trying to, trying to make them say, look, 10% of your marks is at the end of the semester, which is in January, can I ask my phone your five-word findable phrase? And do you show up on the first page? All the way down to an address and a phone number. Do you show up? If you don't, you don't get those marks, but I'll show you how to get there because I've done it for folks.
So that's how I'd answer the competitive analysis thing. Secondly, I, we try to research all the guest speakers. So if you do show up, they will know who you are by image. They will know who you are by key phrase. They will, who, they will have applied a thought bubble to you, what they think you're thinking about, and they'll put you in a context which you don't think you're in because there's a lot of ethos in the world. Okay? And finally, they'll tell you about your competitors. And they'll do all that as background research. They have to do research notes on anyone who talks to them. That's yet again another conceptual framework for competitive analysis of who are you and are you really who you are. Um, I confuse people as I tell people I have five different identities on Twitter, five different nicks. I used to be Ireland on Twitter until I gave that away. And so I can often get confused as to what message I'm supposed to be putting out and which channel that I'm operating in. But you've pivoted already in your business. And, you know, thought box, Ireland, or education, that's going to pivot as well. Nothing lasts forever. So you always, it's good to have more than one identity in life. If people here with starting businesses or maybe growing businesses, can they go down to LIT, get you, get your students to help them do exactly what yeah, you just said? <clears throat> My stuff that I just said, I have it set up with a LEO program, a local enterprise office, so you can come in two hours a night, three nights, and, and take the basics. And if Is you want... Limit, limit LEO? Uh, it's actually the Clonmel Leo, but yeah, I mean, it, I've done it in Leash as well. It, I mean, it's not, there are other people doing the same thing, but it's just the idea, like, if someone's wet, their appetite's wetted for it, they got, before I spend my real money and put, put a lien on the house to do this, I kind of get deeper water, and we have courses that do this. So when Dell wound up in, in uh, Limerick, we did a, a special course for them, a special purpose award to help people go through the deep water investigation of these topics. So yeah, you can, but I mean, this kind of stuff, all the IT should be doing this kind of stuff. I mean, it's not that hard. It's not that hard when you know about it and when you think about it. And when you made the mistakes with it. So you have to make the mistake. You've got to have a dirty bib to tell people how to stay clean. Man in blue at the back, can you shout, please? Hi, uh, it's a question for Edmund. Uh, as your role as CEO and CTO, how do you manage your passion for engineering with the necessity for leadership? Not quite, but I, I, I have been there, I'll put it that way to you, you know. I suppose, how would I describe it? Right. Um, probably what I get my buzz out of, being honest about it, is the technical side of it. Um, but obviously, you know, and a big part of what we do, you know, is, is, is talking about that and is, and is explaining that. Um, Look, it's a case of balance. Um, you know, there's definitely directions that you get pulled that you probably, uh, you know, there's things you have to do and there's things you like to do. That's probably how I describe it. How do I balance it? I, I'm not really sure is my straight answer to you. You know, uh, I don't really have a, you know, a thing that says, geez, that I'm doing this for some of the time, this for more of the time. I think you just, you have to, you know, you have to try and figure out what it is you're trying to do in each area and see you know, see what your objectives are and to try try moving those on all the time. Did you have, once upon a time, a big vision? Did you sit in the bath or sit no. on the bus or something? No. No, 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 no. So it just it grew organically? Yeah, yeah. From yeah. one? Yeah, yeah, from one. Was, I suppose the company was founded by my, my father, let's say. Um, I suppose I'm there since, I suppose I was there when, from when I could walk, first of all. But then I probably went into that business full time in 98. And obviously, then I was into the electronics, the tech, all that side of it, even though I'm a mechanical engineer in background. I'm going to go off on just a little tangent, if that's okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what do you guys think, all of you, think about business books? Have any of you ever read a business book that said, good God, that's a wonderful book? Ed? <laughs> that I could tell you the name of? Probably not. You know, I, I, I've, I, you know, I read different books, but... You know uh, how they word it. You 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 learn something new every day. That's yeah. the first point, and you'll take different things from different things. Um, it's probably how you how you digest that and how you apply it. Because yeah. probably you can read a lot of things, but is, do you apply it after? Is the is the big problem? You know. So. Anybody a fan of business books? I'll give you two titles. I think Isaacson's got a new one on innovation. I've seen the pre-cuts of it's good. And uh, Walter what's Isaacson, it, Walter, Walter Isaac, Isaacson. He wrote, he wrote Steve Jobs, uh, that the authorized biography. And um, Ogilvy uh, have a book on design thinking, which is superb. Okay. Christina? Um, for us, it was, uh, well, when I started the business, we went straight on Launchpad um, in NDRC. And the Bible was the Lean Canvas uh, book. 
um, that was the most useful book for us in terms of business. So you have found books useful. Well, that's good. Yeah. And uh, Eva, have you? Doesn't uh, I can't say I do a lot of reading. <laughs> I have four small kids, and any time that's not on the business is on them. Okay. And that's being straight up and honest. Um, I suppose we. Did, I did come across a, biz, a book called The Business Model Generation. At one stage, it's a, it's a lot more visual, I suppose, and that would have definitely given me some help on the business model. And that. The reason I was asking that really was to find out if any of you, because I was asking out about the big vision you will come across these uber business people, normally white male, uh, who say, I woke up and I had a big vision and I just drove everybody there and I was uh, sitting in a brilliant air. Horrible stuff. Makes me cringe because it's not real people. Lady in orange. I, I have to obviously have to give the, the, the dig back in, as regards competition and the LIT offering the skills. shout out just some so, people so back. So do the LIT, by the way. So, <laughs> you know, to give the opportunity of competitive analysis, we, we, we're offering it as well, so it's alive and well. But I think maybe more fundamentally going forward, looking at the session being on innovation and mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think each of you, if I'm correct, do not come from a business background, per se. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet there's a myth out there that if you want to be in, in the area of entrepreneurship, you should come, even though it's becoming more and more apparent that's not ideally the background to be from. And before coffee, I was talking to one of the computing students from DIT, and the mere mention of the word entrepreneurship, the mere mention of the word innovation, you know, it sends off alarm bells and boost, you know, they, they come up in spots because they resist it so much, and yet it's a reality. So I'm asking each member of the panel if they could share with that identity or, I mean, it's interesting that Ethan started off and said, you know, I'm a physio, and I'll always be a physio. Yeah. But by God, and you know, you're the scientist and always a scientist, but when we look at the success that's evolved, so what is it that ignited the identity of the entrepreneur within each of you? And would you wish that had been ignited a lot earlier? Okay, to answer the second bit, I think what ignited it is, is, is probably liking what you do, which I think is what Eve was saying as well, right? Um, that it's an interesting question, right? Because it was actually one of the, it was the first question that, you know, when I was involved in the, the EY Entrepreneur Year, and I was videoed with a number, number of questions, I was asked all these questions, you know, um, and the first question is, well, you know, when did you consider yourself an entrepreneur? And I said, my answer was never, you know. Um, you know, it was, I consider myself, let's say, an engineer, that's what I, and, and, and still to this day, you know. Um, you know, so I suppose that's probably, that's probably my story, really. I think. I, mean, I think. Yeah, I, I'd be very similar. I'd still consider myself a physio, and I, like that, I'd probably be a physio to my grave. But um, I suppose, in terms of what ignited the the idea, it was really taking what um, I had seen work in terms of e-learning and engagement of students in academia, and you know, working as a lecturer here at the IT and seeing how how our teaching styles and so on changed as technology evolved and as as we could bring multimedia. Into the, into the lecture theatre as we could actually engage students with online, send them to YouTube for clips and so on, and, and looking at how that engaged students in learning. For me, it was a case of, well, we have this problem in clinical practice of getting patients to do their exercises. Everybody goes to the physio. A key part of your treatment is do your exercises when you go home. But there's 70% there's of people that actually don't do their exercises at home. They're at home, you know, seven days of the week. They're in the physio clinic for 30, 40 minutes of that week. So it's what they do in the meantime. That's the, the key part. And for me, it was, why don't we take what, we've, what we know works in another area and apply it into clinical practice? And uh, I suppose that's where, where, our, where it started for me. You realise that Eve has just given you an ad. <laughs> I can just say that person about five, four years ago didn't speak that lingo and now she speaks it like this. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, he's a colleague of mine for years and it's, it's great to listen to it. Oh, absolutely. But it's, it, You're right. it's <laughs> yeah, but, but it's funny. The other thing for me was, you know, I knew this could work. In, in clinical practice and I was searching online for the solution that we could use in the way that I wanted to apply it and it just wasn't there and it was a case of I spoke to a number of colleagues and I spoke to a number of physios and kind of bounced the ideas off and you know everybody thought the idea was great but it wasn't out there um, and it, even in the early stages of the Endeavour program and everybody was doing your stress testing of your business and all the rest of it um, you couldn't actually find the the, the right way of getting it across to the, the patient and then getting that loop of data coming back to the physio. And it was a case of, well, you know, let's just go do it. And it's a big leap and all the rest of it, but, you know, if you have an idea and if you really believe it's going to work, then just go do it. Don't waste any time, just go do it. And that was the best piece of advice I got from actually one of the other lads on the Endeavour programme. It was, 
Aoife, what are you waiting for? Just go do it. Okay, you have to do all this market research and competitor analysis and all the rest of it. Sometimes, just go do it. You know? <laughs> I, uh, Bernie, just yeah. before uh, can I interrupt you? Do you see yourself as an entrepreneur? I yes, because I can. I know what I want to open and start right now in a new incubator that's setting up in Climb Mill. So I know that, and I also know that I've done it before. I've you know filed the papers, done the CRO thing, got a patent on one of the things I helped start up, and then watched it wind down. So I know that. But to answer your question before that, I know. It's probably a, a result of watching my grandfather start a decorating business years before I was born during the American Depression and watching myself and my four brothers and my five cousins work in that business. And like the only way you got lunch out at a pizza hut was to help the uncle and my dad erect a tent or finish up a venue. So it's because of how I grew up. We grew our, we grew our own food across the road. My mom was an, an Iowa farmer, so she was used to pushing cows down the road. She lost her farm, family farm, twice during the Depression. So I grew up with all that, saying, the government's not going to save you. you. You are responsible for taking care of yourself. It's handy that there are supports and grants and expert help, but it's up to you. And I feel like, yeah, okay, I'll do this again and see where it goes. Christina? Um, I guess my story is a little bit different. Um, when I was doing my master's degree in Sligo, um, I was working with the Center for Design Innovation there, so there were a lot of startups around us and we were always surrounded by them and the networking and so on. So that's when I kind of uh, caught the bug and I, that's when I knew I wanted to start my own business. I had no idea what it was going to be. So after that I got a job and uh, I basically said when I will have this amount in my account in savings, I'll quit my job and start a business. Um, so the, the day that happened, I handed in my notice um, and remember uh, kind of looking around and thinking, okay, now what? Um, so I followed my passion in education and that's where ThoughtBox started. Um, but uh, it, it was one of those things that I always wanted to do, if not necessarily for the money, but uh, for the experience as well. It's a disease. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, on the other side, um, talking about innovation and so on, where you're saying, where, where does that come from? For us, um, we learn how to innovate from children. And to be honest, I think that that's something that kids know exactly how to do, and, and they, they're born uh, innovators. But we forget how to do that along the way. Um, they're doing a lot of things right uh, that we, we're either afraid or don't know how to do it anymore. Let us go to the West Kerry Grelta, the Krakowina. Now, can you shout out to the people at the back? I'll show the hello. I am a the animation. I'm going to meet up all the videos that I'm really enjoying it immensely. Just a question is, for we started off, and I think Aoife has answered already, go for it and do it. Go, go for it and do it. What advice would you give to, uh, to a person like myself who's beginning a new journey? I know Susan Jefferson to quote her, feel the fear and do it anyway. From your own past experiences, what would you, advice would you give me? Do you want to give us a hint as to what you want to do? No, we, well, it's uh, a wild Atlantic way. It's tourism related. Okay. Um, can, I, can I interrupt and maybe start? the uh, suggestion, suggestions and please suggest yourselves as well. I'll come back to that crowd elucidate who taught me about the research being done by Tourism Ireland about the German market. They went and they found out that the Germans love, for example, for you, for Kurt Kuchina, is that they love, the Germans love a literary holiday. Upper class, rich Germans love to be seen, to be educated, and they are educated if they read German, sorry, English books from Ireland, as in um, Larry Asperla. And that will, the, Tourism Ireland has that kind of detailed research. So if you were to go to Tourism Ireland and ask them about uh, to access to anything like that, you, it could spark off something within you to say, this might be an idea. You know the Charlie Chaplin Festival down in Waterville? My dad, as I mentioned, was from Waterville. I was brought down there to suggest about trying to get an identity for Waterville. And it's a brand-aware world now. 
And I suggested, now I, I'm old enough to actually have remembered seeing Charlie Chaplin uh, down in Waterville, and I just suggested it to them. That is now something that has happened. There is the festival there, and it gives them a world. And forget about anything small, local. Think world, because you can. It's no longer the dark ages. Mm. Now, sorry, sorry, that's my no, top of the point. Yeah. Sorry, just the point I'm making is, from myself as an individual, mm. regarding the, the, the idea and the concept aside, for the individual themselves, what actually, you know, what would you like to share with an individual when you started on the journey, from your from mm. reflecting back on it? So, uh, for me, um, I'd say, don't do it alone. Uh, whatever you do, get a, a co-founder and uh, it's going to help you a lot along the way. I'm, I'm a sole founder and I would never do this again alone. Um, <laughs> uh, and the second uh, thing that I would share with you is um, try and find somebody that's done it before and um, have them as an advisor or, or as a mentor. Um, for me, that was crucial, especially because I didn't have a co-founder in having somebody as a mentor uh, that I could just pick up the phone to and say, what do you think about this? Uh, that really helped me a lot. I'd add, I'd add to that. When you're trying to find someone as a co-founder, make sure it's not a clone of you. So like in the case of where we failed twice, and we had more than one person, we didn't have good bean counters that asked to look at our spreadsheets a week before the bank manager started asking to look at our spreadsheets. And we didn't have someone who was driven by a commission-hungry attitude to say, I'll chase those invoices, but I want 10% and expenses. So I would say, if you have a solid idea, the only way it's going to work is if you have cash flow and you need someone that doesn't mind banging on doors, opening up new ones and saying, I brought home some new business and I got those invoices for you. So if you're going to hire somebody or a co get a co-finder with you, the person that thinks in terms of the beans they bring to the table for you, so important, that cash flow. Yeah, I suppose I'd agree with both of the, the, the previous speakers on that. I think um, I, I was a sole founder as well, and it's, it's tough. It's tough on your own, definitely. And going back to Bernie's point, the, the best thing that happened me, our business this year is we brought in a CEO um, who, who works really well in that, in, on the whole financial management side of it. Um, um, other than that, I suppose, going go back to the mentor thing, um, I, I would really have valued the time we got from mentors, but I think it's, it's very important that you, you pick and choose your mentors. Um, we would have had one mentor, Breed will be familiar with him, and basically, you know, I could go in for a session with him and he would just, you know, basically throw it. He was like one of the lectures I had in college myself. You'd get back your essay and it would be just red marks through everything, you know. But actually that made you, that brought you to the next level. And so having a mentor who kind of, you know, advises you and tells you you're doing fine all the time, you know, maybe you need some of that, but actually you need the challenge as well. You really need to kind of, that person who challenges you and says, well, actually, is this going to work? You know, have you done enough of the, that competitive analysis? Because, do you know what? I don't think you're right. I think your business model is, is completely the wrong way around and you're never going to make money that way. And then you go away and you think, what, what am I doing here? Am I, should I be here at all? And so on. But then you start thinking and you start looking at different ways of doing it. And then you come back two months later and you realize, actually, he was right. Because we've now found a much better business model. But at the time, you came out of that meeting feeling, you know, six inches tall and kind of going, I've sent, spent the last two years and it's gone down the swanny. You know, so again, pick and choose and, and work out what works for you in your business. Yeah, um... I think there's probably there's probably a number of things. I think first of all, I think mindset. It's back to first of all, right? Um, I think a lot of things are they're 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 a journey on the way, right? Um, so if you think about it, let's say travelling. If we, if we go back, say fifteen years ago, travelling from Kerry to Dublin was a relatively, or let's say twenty years ago was a relatively rare thing. We think nothing of it now, right? And then if you think about that journey, right? And if you were going, let's say, from, from Tralee to Dublin, you can encounter uh, diversions, roadworks, um, things that'll, you know, that'll throw you off your path, right? But just have the mindset to say, right, that's fine, okay, we have a diversion here, we're going to figure it out. Now, today, you have a sat nav, if you're doing that journey, you're not so bothered about the diversion, but you know that you can actually figure it out. That's the first thing, 
It might take you a bit longer and you plan for that, but you can also then think about and say, right, well, what are the things that might throw me off the path? And then how do I take those risks and how do I deal with those? So I think there's that mindset thing. I think that's one side of it, right? Then the other thing is, you know, I, I went back and I said, right, well, who's the customer? And I think that's an important thing to understand. Um, and why would they buy it? And, you know, if you take certain things to the extreme, so, you know, uh, so, you know, how do you make one hell of a difference? Uh, how would you delight the daylights out of a customer? If you ask yourself those questions, I think they're worth the answers that you get to those can sometimes be, they can be quite telling. What a gorgeous phrase. How would you delight the daylights out of a customer? Yeah. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to, that's going to yeah. go into my book that you'll all be reading. <laughs> One other thing to remember is that it's business people. That we are a community. These people have given up of their time to mentor you guys. I've never, and people come onto my program free and for nothing, we don't pay anybody, but they want to be heard and they've got messages and lessons that they want to share because it's whatever is in us. We like telling people, one, our stories, but we also like, in general, to be helpful. So that is why, again, we're all here today. The lady behind you, Jim. Dr. Auntie has already almost uh, answered my question because that has stuck out to me in the last hour listening to you especially my question was going to be directed to Eva and then to the rest of the panel when you talked about setting up your business and the fact that uh, people who go to the physio have this idea that they go to, it's kind of the Irish mindset more so, um, more so than the European one. We go to the doctor and we go to the physio and we think we're going to be fixed. And we don't, we don't go home and think, okay, now I have to do these exercises. So it's all about mindset and I'm just wondering, is, it, is that what what brought you to sort of realising, outside of your journey as a lecturer, that brought you to realise that people needed these apps or, you know, whatever, I'm not fully uh, okay with what you're doing, but that, that they needed something to guide them to do the exercises at home. And what, and then this, and you know, and uh, Dr. Hartley just said it now, it's all mindset. And if you look at the mindset of Ireland 15 years ago and today, and you know, it, it's just, you know, we call it entrepreneurship, and Frida mentioned about, um, you know, uh, or it was mentioned, I don't know if it was Frida, but somebody mentioned about the difference between people who are business students and engineering and that, again, it's all, maybe we should consider calling entrepreneurs <coughs> changing mindset, you know, that, you know, mindset is huge and Ireland has changed so much as well. I see that in all of your stories. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. I think it, it is about a mindset. Um, I suppose I'm, you know, to give you my background, I'm actually from, I'm from Galway. I'm living here in Kerry for the last number of years. I had um, the good fortune of being involved with the Kerry football team for many years. Um, and it's, it's funny, actually, through, through the involvement with the team there, you know, I do see that there is a mindset of winning. You know, and there's no question about it. They're, you know, Kerry, Kerry haven't won 37 All-Ireland football finals on, you know, just getting up to make your place on the team. You win because you want to win. And you win because you want to be competitive. And even the, the, the group of people I met um, in, in Finland this, this year, uh, or this, just this week, they're actually looking at the Finnish um, footballers of the future. And their attitude is, you know, Finland's a small nation. We have, I think, is it five or six million people that they have. They can't afford the attrition rates of the, the, the UK in terms of losing footballers or elite talented footballers um, to injury. If you look at attrition rates in football in, in the UK, they lose a lot of their, their talented players to injury. We po potentially lose a lot of our, our, our talented players here. But again, their mindset is, we'll prepare, we'll, we'll really drive because we want to win. And they're not, they're not playing, you know, they're not playing recreationally or they're not playing, they're playing competitive. competitive. They have 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds. They are, you know, and very much holistically developing the player, developing different characteristics of the player, developing the player to do well in education, in other, in social aspects, in other spheres of his life as well, but equally developing to win. And again, if you want to win Olympic medals, I think for, for Ireland, it's, for me, it's, it's very interesting. Sometimes you'd hear, say, with the GA, you have the Go Games initiative. And, you know, I have four, four children who all play GA. I, I love the GA and all the rest of it. But I hear my six-year-old and my eight-year-old. The ref doesn't keep the score because everyone's, everyone's participating and it doesn't really matter about the score. The lads are keeping the score themselves in the field. 
you, you know, because they're competitive, they want to win. And it's funny, I, I always remember watching um, a programme about the O'Shea brothers and, you know, uh, I think it was Fergal O'Shea was actually talking about their, their grandmother Beatrice marching them, and Jackie would know this, marching them around the kitchen table in, back in West Kerry. And I think Mark was three and, you know, Tomás, I suppose, whatever he was, five or six, and Dara was whatever, seven, wh whatever they were. But they were marching around the, the kitchen table, Beatrice in front of them and saying to them, you know, we're, you're, I'm, I'm the, the Artane Boys band and you're playing for Kerry and Crow Park today. And pull your socks up, pull your shoulders back and m march tall because you're going to win all Ireland medals for Kerry today. And I think when you have a mindset like that, when, you're, when that's bred into you from the age you're whatever you are, then of course you're going to win and of course you're going to succeed. And similarly here, I think the, the programmes that are run at the IT here and in Limerick IT and so on, and, and the Junior Entrepreneurship Programme, I think it's fantastic. Build that entrepreneurship mindset into the kids, you know, from, from that, get, expose them to it. Expose them to the belief that, yes, I can start my own business. Okay, I'm in transition year, but we actually did a business and, you know, we made 200 euros selling whatever it was. That, I think that's fantastic and I, I really take my hat off to the likes of Jerry Kennelly and Breed and the other people in the entrepreneurship programs throughout the country because that's, that's fantastic. It's great for, great for the country. And I think one thing I would say is, um, I suppose, I, I have a foot in both camps, having been there as a lecturer, have work, having worked as a physio in uh, our public service system as well in the HSE and so on, and also having worked in private practice and now working on a business. I think it's really important for us as a country that public and private pull well together. And Colin mentioned earlier on, on Enterprise Ireland, we got fantastic help from Enterprise Ireland. But equally, I think it's very important for, for public services to recognise that it's tough out there building a business. And, you know, I can remember in the early stages for us getting a couple of calls from revenue offices and so on. You know, we were in the early stages. I didn't know one, you know, now we were trying to do everything by the book help us and make it easier for us and help us and okay you're you're in a job where you want to get out the door at 10 to 5 or 5 to 5 you know because you're you're in that job but fine i'm not trying to make it difficult for you just just help me do it right and public and private i think as a as a nation we need to pull our public and private sectors together better yeah, the mindset does seem to be changing though if you look at enterprise ireland today as opposed to 15 20 years ago or if you look at your own personal journey as a lecturer, and you said you were exposed to, you know, the technology changing and all of that, I mean, that has obviously had a huge, um, played a huge part in getting you where you are today. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Bernie, the mind of the entrepreneur, the mindset. The mindset of the entrepreneur inside of my mindset, or do you think, what would, because I, because I, I'm stunned by Aoife, so I'm kind of still thinking about digesting what she said here. <clears throat> well, let me just carry on to the back of something that she said as a footnote, because we're all here to help. So let me tell you the way we helped Aoife, the way we could have helped you, Aoife. Um, I could have taken a mom at home that wanted to raise her two kids, uh, one of whom was diagnosed as having a learning difficulty, and she was a very good accountant. So she would have done the books you needed to keep revenue off your door, and you could have simply told revenue, won't you please call Brita? She'll take care of that for you. And then there would have been a bond because Brita was used to dealing with revenue and she would know exactly when Ita's birthday was and they would take care of itself. Socially, there wouldn't have been a problem. So this is the important footnote I want to throw out. Uh, one of my businesses went to liquidation. I had owed a big company, IBM, 60,000 Irish pounds. Never paid it. Never got thrown into the wolves for it. But because I used the, an audited account system for year after year after year, not even trading, I was struck off the books with no prejudice. That's hard to do in Ireland. So the footnote for you is, it's probably someone listening to me right now thinking about starting. They don't think about exiting until all of a sudden the money is running out. So I'm just here to tell you that if you do have a Brita who does, who do audited accounts for you, you can avoid a 15 to 25,000 euro liquidation fee by simply throwing in those things to the CRO and suddenly you'll just go away, proving the point that public service is actually helping out the private entrepreneur without, without distorting company law. So that's an important thing I learned, kind of by accident. I never paid the bill, they wrote it off, the IBM wrote it off, never paid a liquidator, and I know because my wife was one of the other directors, she's on another board with a credit union, she passed all the property checks, and there's not been a problem. 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but the mindset of an entrepreneur needs to go all the way to exit, someone buying you, or burn off, burn out. <laughs> you've reached the end of your cash flow. You need to know you've looked at that dark side as opposed to the potential of the dollar signs, euro, or um, Saudi reals, whatever they're going to throw at you. Got to know what the dark side is by someone who's gone all the way down and out and come back up. Christina. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit back to what I was talking about before, uh, learning from kids uh, about innovation. And to be honest, I think um, kids have that mindset. Uh, they grow up with it, you know. Um, how many of you have kids here? Quite a few. So um, how many of you had your kid coming to you and say, uh, Mom, Dad, wh why is this happening? Why is the sky blue? And you would give them a, a very good answer. And then they'd say, but why? Um, and you'd say, okay, well, uh, these things are getting a little bit more complicated now. Um, and then they'd ask why again, and that's when you know you're in trouble. Um, you know, and I think that's the mindset that entrepreneurs need to have. Asking why three times in a row gets you into trouble, but it also gets you to um, challenge the status quo and uh, to challenge the way we do things around here. Um, and I think that's the way you innovate and that's the way you, you kind of come up with these new ideas in order to base your entrepreneurship uh, on and uh, your business on. Um, the other thing that I think is very important and that, um, that kids have and gets destroyed along the way is um, uh, they're not afraid, afraid of failure. If they don't know something, they, they just have a go at it. Um, you know, when it comes to, to um, kids, if uh, they're just trying and failing and trying again until they get it right. And I think this is kind of beaten out of us as we, uh, as we go along. But if we're afraid of failure, then we'll never innovate. Um, so um, that mindset, there's a lot of things there to learn from kids and try to actually encourage them to, to keep doing it, question a lot and, um, and not being afraid of, of saying uh, stupid things or asking stupid things because there aren't any stupid things to, to ask out there. Any other questions? At the back there, please. Oh, would you shout out, please? Yeah. Uh, so once you've had your idea and your and you've made your product, how important and I guess how often would you think about improving your product line or How often would you improve your brand new product? I just want to say the one thing, um, do you know what the word ID, ideate is? Ideate? Okay, you need to ideate all the time. Yeah, I, I don't think we ever have our product there. In our case, we're constantly evolving, changing, adding new features. You know, once you get it into the hands of customers, it's fantastic. You get feedback and you realize, actually, we should have done it this way or we should have done it that way. If we did that, it would be so much easier for the customer to use and so on. So ours is a, a technology software and it's always, always changing and evolving. Yeah, con continually. Look, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. So you have to go forward all the time. Are you big enough as a company now to have an R&D team? Yeah, there, yeah, there is. There, yeah, we have an R&D team. Yeah, there's about 30 probably in it. 30. And yeah. at what stage, how big were you when you actually managed? I suppose to, we didn't, uh, we didn't probably thing. formally put it in place. You know, at, at any stage, it kind of evolved to that, so that we've, let's say, I suppose, electronics and the mechanical development side of things and software. Um, and that, that essentially is our R&D team, you know? Okay, so it's not, yeah. it's not a bunch of buffins and white coats with Oh, that. God, no, no, no. Yeah. It has to be very practical. But yet, you know, you ideate, you go through, you know, you, you figure out what it is you want to do, what it is you can do, what it'd be nice to do. Um, you you know. sit on a plane and you look at magazines. Absolutely, all that, yeah. Ideas. Absolutely, absolutely, all that, yeah. Christina? So, uh, your question scares me a bit because it, it kind of alludes to that idea of um, I've got an idea and it's brilliant and uh, I'm just going to go off and build it and then put it out there and so on and, and that's never really going to work. Um, it, it's about building your product with your customer um, and uh, you know going out there and, and continuously testing it um, and uh, you're, you're never finished. Uh, ideally you, you put a minimum product on the market and, and uh, get as much feedback as possible and keep going and keep iterating and so on um, and uh, keep adding to it as, as, uh, as well uh, as everybody else said. Other questions? Okay, I've got a sign, Thank you. Business plan. 
<laughs> We're the great midst of our time. <laughs> Edmund, Ed, did you ever have a business plan? You must have a gold star on that. You make cakes. No, there we go. Um, I think, look, my, my view of business plans is people will ask you for them, they'll talk about all these things, but to me, figure it out yourself what you want to do. There's different areas you have to think about. Um, how would I word it, Joe? Um, you know, there's a place for and a place against, right? That would be my, my straight answer to you. Go on. But you'll probably answer. Yeah, I'll answer it with two other words. Dashboard and spreadsheet, not business plan. So have your dashboard, six things, no more, that you're looking at, red, yellow, green, up and down, area graphs perhaps, not hard to understand, algorithm that works. And a spreadsheet the bank manager respects because you're not fooling them about the cash flow. Spreadsheet and dashboard. Uh, to answer your question, I, I had to write a few business plans. I wrote three business plans so far. Every single one of them became redundant two weeks after I finished. Um, so I'm, in our case, I'm not writing them unless I really have to write them. Um, but we do work a lot with the uh, Lean Canvas. Uh, and that basically has everything in uh, that would go into a business plan in there. Eva, did you ever work off a business plan? Uh, I did. <laughs> it, um, um, I, I, did I work off it? Um, I'm not sure I worked off it. I definitely wrote um, one or two. I suppose when you're when you're pitching to investors and they're looking for business plans, you've no choice. You have to write write them. Um, I always begrudged the time it was taking me to write them because for me it was time away from working on the business and doing what I felt was most important, which was get us customers and get our product into the hands of customers. Um, I'd agree with Bernie's, um, you know, now we work off a rolling sort of top 10 list um, that's, you know, everybody's aware of what the priorities are, what are we doing this week and how is that fitting into our priority list of what we want to achieve for this quarter, quarter, you know, this half year or whatever it is we're working, working on. So we do, we def definitely have our list of key priorities on an ongoing basis, but um, I suppose if we're going for funding again at any stage, we were back to writing the own business plans. <laughs> I re always remember walking in, I walk into Irish businesses in uh, Dublin, primarily where it, where it happens, and before I say this, um, I, I'm actually from Clare, because I remember you were saying Galway, two generations ago, County Clare, a small bungalow, they walked away from it, when it and they end up in the United States. But now, when I walk into the best offices I get a chance to visit Dublin, they normally the guys I'm with will say, please don't look right. And certainly don't let your camera take a picture of our whiteboard. So they use the same thing you're talking about. You can actually see them shifting uh, priorities up and down. And the, the whiteboard is really effective. And Microsoft is a live one that goes back to Redmond all the time. It's pretty interesting how they do their software builds that way. And um, I forget the other thing I was going to say. So I'll just... Okay, I'm going to wrap up with one final question to all of you. Which, if you have the mic. Do any of you do it for the money? Um, we haven't made that money yet if we do. Um, so, no, it, 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 for us, um, it was never about the money. Now, it, obviously, you need the money, and, you know, I just had a conversation this morning with somebody. We're not running a charity shop here. This is a commercial agreement, so it has to be this way. But for us, it's about, I suppose, for me, you know, spending so many years in physio practice, um, l knowing what I knew and learning what I learned through the experience of treating patients, you know, day in, day out, working with everything from elite sports players right through to people who had had bad car crashes and so on. And, um, and knowing there was a better way of doing it. Actually, you know what, there is a better way. There's, there's, you know, if you can actually go out of this clinic and do what I've shown you every day for the next seven, seven days, you'll be so much better when you come back next week. But it was actually trying to, you know, just find what is it that actually makes them do that. And that, that for me, and, and that's what it's still about. And I wouldn't say we're there yet. We're still very much, as I said, evolving the product and getting more customers, getting better feedback and, and, and so on. Um, but we're, we're on a journey and um, we're, 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 hopeful, we're, we're enjoying it on the way. Ed, do you yeah. do it for the money? Yeah, the simple answer is no, right? Um, obviously, look, it's a very important part of the, the equation, but, but, but no is the straight answer, no. People who are not in business yeah. never believe business people who say that. Right. And that's a, that's a yeah, yeah, yeah. refute, please. 
Well, I suppose, look, if you want it, sure. Uh, 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 all you do is sell out. Simple as. Move off to the Bahamas or wherever you want to go, you know. Okay. That would be the simple answer, like. Bernie, money? Um, let me answer the money thing with money. But basically, I remember my grandfather saying, I've run this business for 50 years and never took a salary. Yeah, he paid me as a 10-year-old to do work and my four brothers and my five cousins and we always had a company car and every time we had a job to do we had to eat out and that was a company expense so as a director he took no salary so he wasn't in it for the money he was in it for the revenue and he paid his tax and things went on so I mean how you do it it's not how much is in my current account or in his current account it's like what did you do with the flow of money you had coming in and is there more coming in next month based on how you leverage that flow um, well, to answer your question, about three months ago, we decided to uh, put all our games out there for free um, and to kind of make it our mission to make uh, free quality educational content available for all kids everywhere in the world. Um, so, no, it, it's not really just about the money. If it would be only about the money, you'd burn out very quickly um, as an entrepreneur. Well, I'm delighted. That's a 100% answer. All of you, that's what I always hear, is that it's not about the money. It is about passion and how you bottle passion. Well, that's the, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Or the $64 million question. I'm going to wrap it up because I think the lunch calls, but I want to make sure that we shout out for the sponsors, who is Chris Byrne. Chris is giving a talk here. Chris was at the uh, UL one. He is a wonderful <laughs> businessman and again a, ver a very, very generous man with his time. And he has a session at 2.40. Uh, IDF Marketing in Limerick and Ecos Environment in Limerick are also co-sponsors. Obviously a big shout out to Shane for organising it. And, uh, and, and Karen, yes, in the back. Yeah. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I hope that you are inspired to get out there. No better time in this country yeah. than to set up now. Mm. It is just made for it mm. because we are in recovery and we have learnt many lessons and please God it will never happen to us again. Mm.